Darkcast Network, the light shines brightest on our indie podcasts. 21-year-old Bethany Decker was a young mother and a wife to an Army National Guardsman stationed in Afghanistan. In 2011, she attended college full-time at George Mason University in Virginia and waited tables to make ends meet. Bethany was busy and her husband was away, so it wasn't unusual for her family to go a while without hearing from her. But when weeks passed with no word, they began to grow concerned. That concern grew into fear when family and friends started receiving strange messages from her social media accounts. Bethany's life had become complicated. Her marriage to her husband, Emil Decker, was on the rocks, and she had begun seeing a new man, Ronald Rolden. What's more is that when Bethany was last seen on January 29th, 2011, she was pregnant. It quickly became clear that one of the men in Bethany's life had likely harmed her, but it would be over a decade before an arrest would be made in her case. When a person goes missing, there's a special kind of pain in the not knowing. I want to tell you the stories of those who never came home. Today, I want to tell you the story of Bethany Decker. I'm Kona Gallagher. And I'm Ethan Flick. And this is, And Then They Were Gone. Welcome back, everyone. Welcome back. And welcome to season four. I cannot believe it's season four. I know. Thank you so much, everybody, for your patience with our hiatus. And thank you for listening, even if this is your very first time. Speaking of which, we do have some new listeners. So since it's a new season, I thought it would be a good time to reintroduce ourselves I am Kona Gallagher. I'm a realtor in Northern Virginia by day and a mother to three boys, including my stepson. We started this podcast in 2020. And by that, I mean, I started it and then bullied you into doing it with me. And we have, I have checked 120 episodes for your listening pleasure. Wow. I can't believe we have that many. I know. It's nuts. I just saw it on Apple Podcasts today. So I'm Ethan Flick. Uh, I have 18 years of experience in law enforcement. Uh, I am your hostage <laughs> on on this. Uh, I mean, you're you're right though. On this uh, adventure of ours, but I'm very happy to be here. For those of you that, that don't know, the way the format of this show is, Kona has done all of the research and writing. She wrote a script centered around a missing person, and she is reading the script to me for the first time. So everything that you're hearing and my reactions are genuine because I have no script, so everything is ad-libbed. Exactly, yeah. So a lot of people are like, why doesn't he know anything about the case? <laughs> because it is designed that way. Yes, I am hearing this for the first time as well as you, listeners. Yes. So now that that's out of the way, we do also want to mention that we have a Patreon and a few lovely folks have joined us during our hiatus. So before we get started on the case, which is going to be a two-parter, I should say that right up front, we have got a two-part solved case to kick off season four. Oh, there's a solution at the end of there this. There is. Not this week. Next week. But yes, this is a resolved case. We would like to give our pa- our new patrons a shout out. So thank you very much to Shannon R., who is a former roller derby teammate. Go Misfits. Eva Linda C., Beth, Anna P., Cassie H., Kelsey C., Melissa H., Stephanie B., and Gabby B. You are all extremely amazing. Thank you all so very, very much. And just as a quick reminder, if you subscribe to our Patreon at any level, you will get these episodes early and ad free, as well as a free copy of the upcoming ebook based on the cases that we've covered in the first three seasons of the show. I'm excited for you. 
Uh, <laughs> I am not involved in the book. Yes. And you will also get part two of any two-parters that we do way sooner than people on the normal feed. But as always, enough about us. Let's get into the solved case of Bethany Decker. Bethany Ann Littlejohn was born on May 13th, 1989 in Fredericksburg, Virginia. She was the oldest of three children, and her mother, Kimberly Nelson, said that as a young mother herself, she and Bethany did some growing up together. Bethany also helped with parenting duties for her younger siblings as her mom worked long hours as a nurse. Bethany was a star student. She was popular. She had lots of friends, and she did great in school. Her friends described her as the type who didn't really have to study to get good grades. She graduated from Stafford High School and moved to Fairfax, Virginia, where she attended George Mason University, majoring in global and economic change. I I don't even know what that means. I know. I have no idea either, but it sounds extremely fancy. She did a lot of things um, as well to just make the campus and her community a better place. She apparently started an initiative where um, for the campus eateries, instead of just throwing away the food at the end of the day that they didn't sell, they would take anything that was still good and donate it to local food pantries so it wouldn't go to waste. Ambitious. Exactly. During her freshman year at George Mason, Bethany started dating fellow freshman Emil Decker. Emil was an ROTC and wanted a military career. The two became serious, and when she was 19, Bethany became pregnant. They married soon after, and they were both 20 when they welcomed their son, Kai. The young couple leaned on their families to help as they both pursued education and careers. After their son was born, Bethany continued to attend classes to finish her degree while working full-time at Carabas Italian Grill in Centerville. Emil began training with an Army National Guard unit and was soon getting ready to be deployed to Afghanistan. Bethany started working more, up to six days a week, and she and Emil began seeing each other less and less. Emil had to attend an out-of-state training to get ready for deployment, and while he was gone, Bethany chose to have Kai stay with her mother down in Fredericksburg. It was around this time in 2010 that Bethany shared with her husband that she was afraid that they had rushed into marriage and that she was feeling numb. Well, and that's understandable. I mean... They're young. She's, what, 20 years old? Yeah. Married now with a child, also still going to school. Like, that's that's a lot to have on your plate. Yeah, and working six days a week. Yeah. And, you know, it's great that they had her mother to help with Kai, but her mom lived in Fredericksburg, and that's about two hours away. So she wasn't around the corner or anything like that. And it had to have been difficult you know, for both of them to basically leave Kai with her mother and not be able to see him, you know, all the time, because he's only about a year old at this point. Before he left for this training, Emil also discovered flirtatious text messages on Bethany's phone with a man named Ronald. When he confronted his wife about these messages, she swore that there was nothing going on beyond that. And he just chose to believe her. Because, you know, he was getting ready to go to his final training and be deployed. And he just wanted to enjoy, like, the last days that they had together before that. And things did get better between the couple for a while. Even when Emil did have to go to that first training in Indiana, they would have really good conversations that definitely made him feel as though they were headed in the right direction. But as he said on the episode of Disappeared about his wife's case, that soon stopped. Not just the happy conversations, but the conversations altogether. Bethany suddenly stopped contacting him. When Emil finally reached Bethany, she told him that she didn't want to talk to him and that she didn't love him anymore. Ouch. He says that he also heard a man in the background during this conversation telling Emil to man up. What the hell? Yeah, I, I like talk about one, a terrible conversation to have with your wife after, you know, first you think things are like maybe getting a little bit better, then she just stops talking to you altogether. And then to hear some guy in the background saying like, yeah, bud, it's over. Like, it's awful all around. Yeah. And I'm sure that put him in a great mindset to go overseas and fight in a war. Exactly. Because he deployed to Afghanistan soon thereafter. 
And, you know, obviously we don't know for sure, but the man in the background was likely Ronald Rolden, who had become Bethany's boyfriend. Rolden and Bethany worked together at Carabas. They started a flirtation, which, you know, Emil found out about. And Bethany also allegedly confided to her friends that she wanted to take it further than that. One of these friends, Sarah, who was Bethany's former on-campus roommate, was interviewed on that episode of Disappeared. And she said she was shocked by the entire situation, which was very out of character for Bethany. But Bethany decided to pursue this relationship and was eventually very open about it to friends and family, if not necessarily her husband. Shortly after Emil deployed, Bethany moved into an apartment in Ashburn, Virginia. Ashburn is located in Loudoun County, which neighbors Fairfax County, where Bethany attended school and worked. Rolden also moved into the apartment, though Bethany's was the only name on the lease. I'm a little confused by that. And this is strictly for uh, anybody listening that understands the geography of this area. Right. Ashburn is not close to, or it's close, I guess, as the crow flies, but it's not close as far as commuting to Fairfax or Centerville. Yeah, I never understood that either because, you know, you read some articles that are like, she moved to Ashburn to be closer to work. And it's like, no, she doesn't. No, Centerville <laughs> is not. I mean, Ashburn is not close to Centerville at all. Yeah, I mean, it's not terribly far. But yeah, like it's, it, it there was weird. There are plenty of other places to live right? <laughs> closer to George Mason or Centerville. Yeah, I really did not understand why she moved to Ashburn of all places. And the other thing is, is it seemed like she it was only a short term lease because she only lived there for a few months and she wasn't like scheduled to live there longer. It, I, I The whole That's thing also weird. Yeah. was very strange. All around very bizarre circumstances yeah. for her moving to Ashburn. Exactly. But her moving to Ashburn for those just couple of months is what brought this entire case here to Loudoun County. You know, whether it was that move or just everything in general, no one in Bethany's life really understood what she was doing. Sure, they could empathize with the feeling of rushing into marriage too young, but Emil was a good guy. People described him as a romantic, and by all accounts, he was good to both Bethany and Kai. Rolden, on the other hand, was not. Both Sarah and Bethany's mother, Kimberly, described abusive behavior on his part. Sarah said that when she would hang out with Bethany, Rolden would constantly call and text her to make sure that he knew what she was doing and with whom. He would even make her send him photos to prove that she was doing what she said she was doing. That's, I mean, that's borderline psychotic behavior. Yeah, and it's definitely abusive behavior. Oh, yeah, like 100% controlling. Yeah. Like, not okay. Not at all. Kimberly, and this is wild to me, Kimberly said that he would also follow Bethany sometimes, including a time when he followed Bethany to her house, her mother's house in Fredericksburg, two hours away, just to make sure that Bethany was actually visiting her. Yeah. Once again, psychotic behavior. Yeah. Like that's, that's completely nuts. It is. And obviously this emotional abuse, like this controlling behavior is bad enough. But Kimberly also says that Bethany revealed that Rolden had been physically abusive to her as well. Kimberly also suspected that he had put his hands on little baby Kai. According to her, Kai had two black eyes on his first birthday. And, you know, Bethany said that he had fallen while playing, which is completely reasonable. Kids do that kind of stuff all the time. They always have like weird bruises and cuts and scrapes and everything all over them. Like that's not, you know, unusual, but given everything else. Well, I mean, it is slightly unusual to have two black eyes. Yeah. With, you know, nothing else, presumably. But I think the story was like he was like playing with a chair and the chair like fell on, you know, it was just something like that. And it's like, it's sure. Could it happen? Absolutely. But it's just, it's just odd to have 
two black eyes. No, it is for sure. And, you know, her family was concerned for both of them. Bethany, young and feeling as though she was missing out, ran straight into the arms of an abuser. And what's worse is she became pregnant with his baby. Now, the timeline of all of this is very fuzzy. Most sources said that she was about five months pregnant when she disappeared, but I believe it was closer to three. Some sources make it seem as though Emil found out about all of this when he came back from being deployed, but from what it sounds like and from what he said on that episode of Disappeared, he knew before he was deployed and he kind of had, you know, a general idea of what was happening while he was gone. He knew she was pregnant? That I'm not exactly 100% sure about. That part of it he might have found out when he got back, but he knew about the relationship for sure Okay. before. The reason why I think there's a big discrepancy in the numbers and why so many sources say that she was five months pregnant is because I think that initially Bethany may have told people that she was five months pregnant because that would make it possible that it was Emile's baby. It turns out that she was likely closer to three months pregnant and Emile was deployed for four months. Gotcha. Yeah. What we do know for sure is that in late 2010, Bethany was beginning to feel as though she had made a mistake with Ronald Rolden. According to her mother, she and Bethany had conversations about her leaving Rolden and even called the National Domestic Abuse Hotline. They even discussed seeking a protective order against him, but Bethany says she didn't think it would work, that he would just break it. She was, at this time, also exploring the idea of repairing her marriage with Emil. When he returned to Virginia on leave in January of 2011, the couple took a week-long trip to Hawaii to see if they could work out their issues and rekindle their romance. Despite her misgivings about Rolden, Bethany was still in a relationship with him, and they still shared an apartment. In fact, when they returned from their trip to Hawaii, Bethany and Emil went over to her grandparents' house in Columbia, Maryland for dinner. During that visit, it was clear that Rolden was still very much part of the picture. Bethany's grandmother says that she was texting him all evening, that Bethany was texting him all evening, that she seemed stressed and scared. And she even said in, like I said, in that episode, it disappeared that like Bethany said something to the effect of she has never felt more stressed in her entire life. Bethany's grandmother wanted Bethany and Emil to stay the night, but Bethany said she had to get back home and seemed just very concerned about having to get back home that night. Bethany, after saying that, abruptly grabbed her keys and left, and Emil followed her. That night, January 28th, 2011, was the last time anyone in Bethany's family saw her. According to Emil, Bethany went back to her apartment that night, and Emil went to the house where he was staying. He was due to ship back out to Afghanistan on February 2nd. Even though the relationship was strained, clearly, Bethany had promised to take him to the airport and see him off, and that's something that she always did whenever he had to leave. But when February 2nd arrived, there was no Bethany. Despite their estrangement, her not showing up worried Emil enough that he called her work to see if she had been coming in, and they confirmed that they had not seen her all week. Emil then called Bethany's family to let them know what was happening and that they should call and check in on her. He then boarded his plane to Afghanistan. Over the next few weeks, Bethany's family and friends tried to get in touch with her, but no one could. Bethany's mother, Kimberly, said that they weren't terribly concerned at first because Bethany was so busy with work and school and obviously had a lot going on in her life. And apparently it wasn't abnormal for her to like just not pick up the phone and not text people back like she would do this fairly frequently. Where's Kai during all of this? Kai's with Kimberly, Bethany's mom. Okay. But it's... It's common for her to go that long without seeing her son? 
I guess, yeah. I mean, that's kind of what it sounds like is that she would go like weeks at a time without without seeing him. But a few weeks after Bethany was last seen, her friend Sarah said that she saw Bethany's name pop up on Facebook Messenger. And like I said, Sarah was one of the people who had been trying to get in touch with her and couldn't. It was like getting a little concerned. And so obviously when she saw her name pop up, she was like, oh, thank God. So she immediately messaged her. But when Bethany replied and they started talking, she knew she was not talking to her friend. Sarah, who, like I said, had already been growing concerned, knew then that something was terribly wrong. She called Bethany's grandmother and told her what had happened. And it turns out that Bethany's family had received strange Facebook messages as well. And Emil had even received what he called a sketchy email from her account that he also did not believe was her. And that makes sense in that, like, I'm sure that Emil doesn't really have a lot of access to Facebook, but... But they have access to email, yes. Right. On February 19th, about three days after these messages started popping up, Bethany's grandparents drove to her apartment in Ashburn. They found Bethany's car parked at a weird angle in the lot, covered in dust with a flat tire. So they went up to her apartment and knocked on her door, but nobody answered. It was then that they decided they needed to do something. They called the Loudoun County Sheriff's Department and reported Bethany missing. Now, already we're in a bad spot. Three weeks after a person goes missing is obviously not the ideal time to start a missing person's investigation. So the benefits, the only benefit of Bethany being reported missing so late is that Police took it seriously quickly, right? Because by that time, like, she, it's been three weeks, right? She's pregnant. Like, her car is in the parking lot. She hasn't shown up to work or school. Right. There's enough mysterious circumstances that it's not like, oh, she'll, she'll be, show up. She'll be back. Yeah. So we at least got to skip that part and go straight to the investigation. Bethany was last seen by her grandparents on January 28th with Emil following her. So it seems initially as though her husband may have been the last person to see her alive. That'd be the logical place to start. Exactly. If you're jumping right to foul play, I think the jilted husband who oh, yeah, whose wife was texting her boyfriend at dinner after they got back from Hawaii and is pregnant with this dude's baby, like... Yeah, I mean, that's a pretty natural first sure. suspect. Yeah, all the, all the signs point to him. Yeah, and I remember when this was originally happening in 2011, and I heard just like, you know, the three-sentence summary of this case. I'm like, oh, yeah, like, clearly her husband did something to her. Like, What's funny is I don't remember any of this, and in 2011, I was literally living right down the street from her. Yeah, I know. I mean, I was also living in Ashburn, but like on the other side of town. But yeah, you were like probably a half a mile from her. Interestingly, uh, one of the first people to partially clear Emil, although not totally and not intentionally, was Ronald Rolden. When police initially interviewed Rolden, he told them that he saw Bethany on the afternoon of the 29th, the next day. So he was the first person to confirm that whatever happened to Bethany, it didn't happen the night that they left the grandparents' house and Emil followed her. (laughs) That's interesting. Yeah. Or stupid. I mean, it is what it is, right? And that was corroborated by the restaurant where she worked because they said that Bethany had called in on the afternoon of the 29th to get her schedule for the week. So right now, like everything's kind of lining up, like whatever happened to her did not happen the night of the 28th. Uh, She was fine the morning of the 29th. She was fine the afternoon of the 29th and rolled in and her job are saying the same thing. Either way, that clears a meal. For that night. For that night. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. However, during that interview, Rolden apparently gave conflicting information about when he noticed that Bethany's car was in the lot at their apartment complex. Because his story was like, oh, yeah, she was here in the afternoon. I saw her. Everything was fine. And she left. And I don't know where she went. But 
her car had been there for like several weeks. And so he apparently didn't have a very good answer about that. Mm. About like that, why that didn't ring alarm bells. Sheriff's deputies, of course, interviewed Emil, who was back in Afghanistan by this time. And Emil was extremely cooperative. He answered all of their questions, mainly via email, and worked with them and the army to come back to Virginia for further questioning. Emil returned to Loudoun County for face-to-face interviews. Police said that he continued to cooperate fully with the investigation. Reports later came out, and this, I'm talking like 2015, like years later, came out that during that interview, Emil actually underwent hours of interrogation and agreed to take a polygraph test. Now, those results were not released, and like I said, I didn't even see any mention of that happening until 2015. But after that in person interview in 2011, Emil did retain a lawyer. However, the lawyer told ABC7 in 2015 that Emil has nothing to hide and is still willing to meet with investigators and answer any questions, but with counsel present. Yeah, that's smart. Yeah, exactly. And keeping in mind, so Bethany disappeared in 2011. That disappeared episode that I referenced so much that Emil was a part of was in 2012. Even after he had his lawyer and after this interview and everything, like he still went on to speak to the media. Exactly. Right. To like tell his part of the story and like, you know, to help get awareness of Bethany's case out there. After Emil's interview, LCSO spokesperson Craig Troxell stated that the sheriff's office had not identified a person of interest and that they had uncovered no evidence that indicated foul play in her disappearance. Bethany's lease at the Ashburn apartment was up at the end of January, which was another reason that everyone was concerned because, again, she went missing on January 29th. She was supposed to be up and out of that apartment two days later. And so when police went there uh, in February, like, Rolden was still there. Right. And it looked like Bethany had been packing her stuff up, but apparently, like, Her ID was there. Her passport was there. Like, it didn't look like she had packed for a trip. You know, it looked like she had been packing to move. Mm -hmm. But it didn't really look like anything was missing, you know. So after all of this kind of started happening, I'm not exactly sure when, sometime like toward the end of February, I guess, Rolden did move out of the apartment and moved back in with his mother in Centerville, which is a nearby town in Fairfax County, which is also where the Carabas is, where they both worked. Now, here's where we first start to see how this investigation fell apart. Now, I'm going to be critical of our sheriff's department here, but I do want to preface that by reiterating that it is absolutely not their fault that they got started so late and that absolutely put this entire investigation at a disadvantage, no matter who was leading the investigation. 100%. Like you start three weeks after somebody's missing, like you are way behind the eight ball on this. So on February 19th, when they got the case, they then started to do what you would want them to do. They interviewed the family. They interviewed the estranged husband. They interviewed the boyfriend. They brought the estranged husband to Virginia from Afghanistan to interview him in person. They spoke with people at her job. And, you know, I would assume, even though I haven't seen this anywhere explicitly, that they spoke with people at George Mason, where she went to school as well. It, it, it started out fine. Now, when police interviewed Rolden, I do believe it was at the apartment. From what it sounds like, he gave them permission to kind of look around, right? And I, I never read that anywhere explicitly, like I said. But police did say that, you know, they observed... Like I kind of said that she had been packing and that her ID was there. So it does seem as though they were able to look around the apartment. But there is a big difference between police casually looking around at the beginning of an investigation and executing a search warrant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all of that's plain view doctrine. So, I mean, they could have they could have actually observed that and not even gone into the apartment. Right, exactly. Although, you know, from what it sounds like, like I said, I mean, especially with seeing the ID in the passport. Sure, it sounds like they were yeah. invited in, but... 
Right. But we don't know. But you're right. It is absolutely just plain view doctrine. It doesn't sound like they were going through anything. I also have a question, and I'm not sure whether you're going to get to this, but did they ever do anything with her car? No. They didn't search her car. They didn't like impound it. They didn't do forensic tests. I have never found any information about anything that they did with her car. In fact... Other than they found it at in her parking spot with a flat tire. Yeah. Parked oddly, quote unquote. Yeah. Her car actually only comes up one more time and in a more of a kind of minor way and it's later. So yeah, no, I, I have to my knowledge, like, no, they didn't impound the car. Okay. And also to my knowledge, LCSO never executed a search warrant at the Ashburn apartment where according to Rolden himself, she was last seen. It seems like a huge oversight at the time, but now over 10 years later, we're beginning to see how much this truly hurt the investigation. And I'm dumbfounded by the car too. Like that, I, I don't understand. They made the observation of saying it was parked at a, at a weird angle yeah. with a flat tire covered in dust. So it had obviously been there for several weeks. What happened to her car? Why wouldn't you search the car? Why wouldn't you search the apartment? Yeah, no idea. I mean, other than the fact that they kept on saying that there was no evidence of foul play. And it's like, of course there isn't. You haven't looked for any, but... It doesn't matter whether they're... Th- yeah. Like, you don't know that until you look. Yeah. And so to, you know, to that point, to like some of these unanswered questions... I submitted a FOIA request for the sheriff's department back in the fall, but because this was still an open investigation at the time, it was denied. So I'm really kind of relying mainly on the news reports and it's been really tough. I've had to piece a lot together because as is normal in cases like this that span years, certain things get printed that aren't necessarily true, but then they just get reprinted and become fact. Like the fact that she was five months pregnant is, is reprinted in every, like so many sources. Right. But it's rumor. Right. And it, and it was incorrect and it, it was three months. Right. And I mean, there are other things that say that like it was her in-laws who were in Columbia, but it was actually her grandparents, like just stuff like that. Right. So this has been tough. Now that we have more of a resolution to this, I'm going to resubmit my FOIA request. So we'll see what happens with that. In any case, getting back to 2011, on March 2nd, LCSO held a press conference in which they asked for the public's help in locating Bethany. Okay, well, that that's good. Yeah. Crystal Owens, who's the Latin Times Mirror reporter, she was um, who covered this case. She was on the episode Disappeared as well. And she was like, yeah, that was really weird because they don't do that very often here. Like it's a, you know, relatively small ish area, not a a ton of crime. So we don't have a lot of like law enforcement press conferences about cases. So that in and of itself was very unique and really kind of piqued her interest and a lot of people's interest. Now that was March 2nd, the following week, The sheriff's office executed a search warrant, but not at the apartment. They executed it at Rolden's mother's house in Fairfax County, where he was staying at that time. Where he was staying at the time that the search warrant was issued? March 2nd, you know, or like that week, right? Not where he was staying or where she was staying when she went missing. Correct. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And now it makes sense. Like, it's definitely good that they did that because what they were mainly looking for was were electronics because they were trying to figure out what the deal is with those Facebook messages. Somebody was impersonating Bethany and the general idea was that whoever was impersonating Bethany was probably responsible for whatever had happened to Bethany. Yeah, sure. Right. So Nancy Grace uh, covered this case and it was reported on that show on March 10th that police executed a search warrant seeking photos of Bethany, fingerprints, biological stains, fluids, 
trace evidence, records, receipts, weapons, notes, and controlled substances. At a house where she never resided. Correct. Okay. They also reported that the warrants also stated that it was on suspicion of first or second degree murder. Now, this is interesting because, again, at this time, the sheriff's office and for months and like even years after kept on saying there's no evidence of foul play. There's no evidence of foul play. But on the search warrant, they said on suspicion of first or second degree murder. I'm actually kind of surprised that they got a search warrant from a judge, given the fact that there was no evidence that she ever stayed or lived at that residence. Yeah. I mean, I guess, so like I said, they, this was in Fairfax County. Yeah. I guess that they just had enough to compel his electronics, right? And like wherever those happened to reside. So yeah, they, according to the show, deputies recovered, quote, two BlackBerry cell phones from this house, three other phones, a Mac notebook computer, video recorder, photos, ticket stubs, a receipt from a gas station, immigration papers, and a black duffel bag with documents in it, end quote. Now, like, that's five cell phones, and that's a lot, but apparently there are a bunch of people living in this house, so they just, like, scooped up every phone that they could find. Like I said, I think the main idea behind this was to figure out if he was the one sending those Facebook messages. Now, we don't know what, if any, conclusions they were able to draw from the items seized from Holden's home, but none of them led to an arrest. In fact, nothing led to an arrest. None of the interviews or any tips that they may have received. The apartment where Bethany lived was in a developed area. There was and is a large field nearby, though the field was larger at the time. And there were some trees, but we're not talking about like a huge, dense forest or anything like that. Police searched that area on March 1st. They apparently had ATVs and dogs and a helicopter and and did search around the apartment building, but found nothing. Once again, I'm sorry. I'm going to keep harping on this. They went through the trouble of all of that, but they didn't think to search her actual apartment. I, I, I don't know. As I mentioned earlier, in March, shortly after this search of the field, Rolden got a lawyer and stopped cooperating. And police just eventually let it go. Steve Simpson, the sheriff at the time, told the Latin Times Mayor, quote, Some are cooperative, some are not. We feel we have probably interviewed folks in this investigation already that probably have information that we would like to have and have been reluctant to hand that information over yet. So we're hopeful that, as the days go by, that they'll realize that if they have information, no matter how insignificant they think it is, they will give it to us, end quote. Okay, so I I know that you're putting specific inflections. I'm being a little bit of a dick, yes. Yes, however, that statement, even without the inflections, <laughs> is incredibly infuriating. Like, Yeah, and that dude was sheriff here for like a hundred years. How the fuck do you just completely dismiss an investigation like that? That that was like a hundred percent dismissive. Like, yeah. oh yeah, I feel like we we talked to some people and uh, we're they gonna, probably know some shit. They know eh. some shit. We're gonna put this on the shelf and hope that somebody uh, comes in and admits to it. Okay, babe, they're not in Pittsburgh. I know, but I can't. <laughs> like, I, I I don't I don't know how else to make this sound. Yeah, more podunk than that. Like it, it's just like, what the hell. Yeah. That is not an investigation. That's like, ah, eh, we did some stuff. I, know. I don't know. We're going to put it on a shelf. Hope for the best. Yeah. I mean, basically. And as the months went on, Bethany's family held out hope that she was still alive, hiding from her abusive boyfriend. Like, that was the big hope that they had, that she was so scared of Ronald that she didn't think that she could leave him. She didn't think she could get a protective order. So they were hoping that she thought that her best option was to run and have this baby and do it far away.
In August 2011, Bethany's baby was due. Detectives contacted hospitals up and down the East Coast in hopes that someone had either seen Bethany or just to give them a heads up in case somebody matching her description came in to have the baby. But unfortunately, nothing came from those inquiries. And unfortunately, like Sheriff Simpson said, they tried some stuff. They tried some stuff, but Roldan didn't find it in his heart to give the sheriff's office any more information. So he just went on with his life. He stayed in the area, worked in restaurants, and continued to date and abuse women. He did this for the next three years. And even though he wasn't exactly keeping his head down and his nose clean, his actions didn't make a lot of waves in terms of Bethany's case. At least not until 2014. That November, nearly four years after Bethany was last seen in Virginia, Ronald Rolden was arrested in North Carolina. While the arrest wasn't for anything directly related to Bethany, it would soon prove to be the catalyst that would finally get her case moving again. Early on in the morning of November 12th, 2014, Rolden and the woman he was living with, Vicki Willoughby, got into an argument. The argument quickly escalated into physical violence. Fearing for her life, Vicki went for a 38 caliber handgun she had hidden. She managed to shoot Rolden twice, once in the abdomen and once in the chest. But that didn't stop him. She said later that if anything, it just made him angrier. And he managed to wrestle the gun away from her and shoot her twice, once in the arm and once in the face. Vicky was able to get help somehow, and both of them were taken to the hospital. It was quickly determined by police that Vicky was acting in self-defense, so she was not charged. Rolden was charged with assault with a deadly weapon with the intent to kill, inflicting serious injury, discharging a firearm in an occupied dwelling, causing injury, and assault. The publicity from this arrest, of course, brought new attention to Bethany's case with many, like me, for instance, wondering why Loudoun County basically failed to stop this man. Rolden's attack on Vicky wasn't the first time something like this had happened after Bethany's disappearance. While still in Virginia, he started dating another waitress named April Snyder. In early 2014, the pair got into an argument and Rolden threw her belongings onto the front lawn. He also spat on her face, pushed her down the stairs, and grabbed her arm. He was arrested, but the charges were eventually dropped after he agreed to pay April $2,500. Was that arrest in Loudoun County or was that Fairfax? It was in Fairfax. Okay. Actually, it could have even been in Prince William because he was working at Man- in Manassas at one point, so it was not in Loudoun regardless. All of that would have come up in a history search, criminal oh, yeah. history search. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's all there now. Rolden met Vicky shortly thereafter at Malone's, a restaurant at which they both worked in Manassas. They started casually dating, and he told her that he needed a place to stay. She said she let him move into her place, but that he had his own room. The relationship progressed, however, and Rolden became more controlling. Weird. Yeah. Of that time, she said, quote, I became isolated and scared, end quote. Standard abuse tactics. Exactly. He's just repeating his same patterns. Vicky decided to break it off and head down to Pinehurst, North Carolina, where she owned a home already. She made the mistake, however, of telling Rolden her plan, and he insisted on following her down there. Within six weeks, Vicky began to believe that Rolden was going to kill her. She told the Daily Mail, quote, He used to have these episodes when his mood went very dark. I numbered them. At the end of October, he had episode number eight, end quote. That's when she began hiding two revolvers in her home. She would also wait until he went to sleep and then unlock all of the doors in the house so she would be able to make a quick getaway if she needed to. Vicky details the horrific violence of that November night in 2014, but we don't need to get into that here. It ended with her stumbling out of her home, bloody and topless, ringing her neighbor's doorbells, trying to wake somebody up to help her. One man finally came downstairs with a gun 
and told her that he had called the police because he thought somebody was trying to break into his house. Once he saw Vicky, though, he pulled her inside to safety. After this attack, Vicky ended up spending five days in the ICU and lost her right eye. In 2016, she went to court with the hopes of testifying against the man who terrorized and nearly killed her. By this time, she had also come to believe that Rolden had done this before. According to Vicky, during that November attack, Rolden told her, quote, I've made someone disappear before and I'll do it again, end quote. In 2015, while Rolden was being held in jail awaiting trial for the shooting, Loudoun County deputies traveled down to North Carolina to see if maybe he wanted to have a chat about Bethany. He did not. The trial was set to move forward, and Vicki prepared to testify against her former boyfriend. She wasn't alone, though, because she had a supporter, Kimberly Nelson, Bethany's mother. The two had gotten in touch, and Nelson had promised Vicky that she would drive down to North Carolina to attend the trial. Vicky, however, would never get the chance to tell her story in open court. Because Vicky was the one who fired the first shot, the prosecutor was afraid that he wouldn't be able to get a conviction, so he offered Walden a deal. Are you kidding me? I mean, it was such a clear-cut case of self-defense that police determined, like, that night— that she didn't do anything wrong and did not charge her and charged him with attempted murder. Right. But despite all of that and despite his patterns, they decided that it wasn't worth going to trial. In 2016, both Vicki and Kimberly were in the courtroom as Ronald Rolden pleaded guilty to two reduced charges. Felony assault with a deadly weapon with intent to kill inflicting serious injury and felony assault inflicting serious bodily injury. He was sentenced to 72 to 99 months in North Carolina prison and was set to be deported back to Bolivia at the end of his sentence. With time served, that meant that he could be out as early as 2020. And that's where we're going to leave you this week with where the investigation stood in 2016. Ronald Rolden, you know, was from Centerville, but he was originally from Bolivia. His parents brought him over when he was a child. And after his conviction, he was in jail and set for deportation back to Bolivia at the end of his sentence. Loudoun County was back in the national spotlight, and the sheriff's department, now led by Sheriff Mike Chapman, was facing scrutiny. Next week, we'll pick up here and examine the renewed investigation into Bethany Decker's disappearance. Can't wait to hear what our wonderful Sheriff Chapman did or did not do picking up the pieces to this case. Yeah, it's really when I was writing this part that I determined this had to be a part two because it's there's a lot happening here that I think we need to talk about. So part two of the Bethany Decker story will be released on Friday, March 4th, or you can listen to it right now by subscribing to our Patreon. Bethany Ann Little John Decker has been missing from Ashburn, Virginia since January 29, 2011. She was a white female with brown hair and brown eyes and was approximately 4 foot 11 and 130 pounds at the time of her disappearance. She was around three months pregnant. Bethany was the victim of intimate partner violence. If any of the situations in this episode sound familiar to you or someone you know, please contact the National Domestic Violence Hotline at 1-800-799-SAFE. You can also text START to 8788 or visit thehotline.org. Since Bethany's disappearance, her mother Kimberly Nelson has been involved in the organization Help Save the Next Girl. Help Save the Next Girl was started by the Harrington family, whose daughter Morgan, a Virginia Tech student, was murdered in 2009 after attending a concert in Charlottesville. 
Their primary focus is to spread safety information and prevent future crimes against young women. You can learn more and get involved at helpsavethenextgirl.com. You can see all the sources for this episode along with photos and videos at our website, and then they were gone.com. And be sure to follow us on social and then they were gone pod on Facebook and at ATTWG pod on Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter. If you like what we're doing, please subscribe and consider leaving a five-star review on Apple podcasts. It will help new listeners find us. And the more people that listen, the more chances we have of bringing someone home. And we'll see you here next week for a brand new episode. See you next week. And then they were gone is hosted by Kona Gallagher and Ethan Flick. Our research writing and editing is done by Kona Gallagher. The music is The Stork by Ketza. Additional music is provided by Kai Engel. And Then They Were Gone is a Little Monster production. Hey, you can do it! <laughs>